Welcome to another message from Citizen Heights. We are located in the nation's capital, where our heart is to inspire hope, remove limitations, and help you experience God's possible for your life. Join Pastors Michael and Heather Giroux in their passion to help you live your best life. We hope you enjoy today's encouraging and uplifting message. All right, wasn't that fun? A little competition, kicking field goals. Way to go, guys. And uh, we're excited for what God is going to do today, aren't you? And uh, again, our online campus, we're uh, so glad that you're joining with us today. So go ahead, give yourself a screen name, join the chat. Our facilitators are there to pray with you and uh, keep the conversation going wherever you're viewing from today. Um, and uh, God is going to do some great things. All right, you ready to dive into this church? Turn with me right now, if you will, to Romans chapter 12. We're going to take a look uh, at Romans 12. We love the Bible here at Citizen Heights. Anybody with me? We love the Bible, and uh, we want to be a Bible-based church. We want to be people who are following Jesus, who are obeying His Word, and uh, learning His Word, learning what it means to, to live for God and live um, according to the principles of His Word. Is It's an essential part of our role as a church is to talk about the Bible and to talk about God's Word for our lives because He's speaking to you. How many have ever said to yourself, I, I wish God would just answer this or I wish God would just tell me, you know, whether I should date this person or what major I should select or what job I should take. And uh, I'm a big believer that God speaks through what He already said. And uh, if you are reading the Bible, it's amazing how God will highlight things and, uh, and, and awaken you uh, to, to answers to things that he's written uh, and said thousand years ago. And all of a sudden it becomes alive to you today. And uh, we're going we're gonna to jump in to a series that we're on week three. It's called Life Traps, uh, Escaping the Past and Escaping the Patterns that Hold Us Back. And so I uh, hope you're ready today to, to get back into it. I, I love seeing everybody rep their, uh, their uh, favorite team. Looks good on you. And uh, I have my Chase Young Commanders jersey on underneath here. Yeah, and we're hoping for big things today. We play the Giants today. And uh, so uh, whatever team you're repping, I'm glad to see we have some team spirit uh, in the room. Actually, we were talking last night. It's been... Uh, my boys and I, we were talking, it's been 32 years since the uh, local team has won the championship, the, the Super Bowl, uh, uh, 32 years. And yet every year, every single year, at the beginning of the season, uh, th we have all this hope. And we're talking about it, and we're like, this is our year, this could be the year, you know, why not? Why not this year? And then you get to about week seven where we are in the NFL schedule, and we're like, yeah, that's why. Not this year. That's that's the reason why. Uh, but, you know, 32 years of bad drafts and early exits, but you still are filled with hope. You know, like, maybe this is the year. Um, and, and I hope I, I want to stir that hope. I wonder if we can just kind of stir that hope today for, for your life, for your life today that maybe you've struggled for, with things. Maybe it's been days. Maybe it's been decades. Maybe you've struggled with things. Maybe there's been cycles and patterns uh, in your life, but why not today? You know what I mean? Like, why not? Why not this series? Why not this Sunday? Why? Why not God come through and really bring breakthrough to some things that you've been that you've been uh, caught in the pattern and the cycle for? And that's really what this series is about. Life traps is, is really we've been looking at how our histories. Everybody say history. How our histories can result in a pattern. Of beliefs that lead us into unintended cycles so you have your history but your history can also introduce to you a, a pattern of belief something that you decided to believe one day you just woke up and said I guess this is true I guess I'm gonna have to defend myself I guess nobody's gonna really come through for me or whatever conclusion you came to that brought you to a pattern of belief that led you to an unintended cycle of dysfunctional living. So that's really what we're talking about is let's get out of this pattern of dysfunctional living 
uh, and we've been using Romans 12 too to kind of set the, the backdrop. So let's get to Romans 12 too. I, I gave you the address. The team can put it up on the side screen so we can see it together. Online campus, you're with us too. So let's read it. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his good will, his pleasing will, his perfect will. Can you say amen to the Bible? See, the Bible's unlike any other book that you and I have ever touched or read or picked up before. Because it's more than history, it's more than analogy, it's more than mystical poetry, it's more than platitudes and principles. The Bible is, God says, it is my word. It's what I've said and what I'm saying to you. And when we read Romans 12, too, we're reading more than just an insight. We're reading the breath of God that he's exhaling into you and I, that we would be endued with a sense of power to step in to a new way of living. And what does it say? It says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. There's two choices. You can either conform to the pattern of this world or... You can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then it says, if you allow yourself to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and at the close of our discussion today, we will go through some things that will help you transform and renew your mind in the area we're discussing today. I'm literally just going to read five or six scriptures that, as you write them down, or if you have your uh, Citizen Heights app open, you can, you can follow along in them in the discussion notes. And you'll see those because by the washing of the water of the word, we renew our mind. It transforms your mind because you're saying, I have thoughts, I have ideas, I have beliefs. But what does God say is true? And it says that if we are transformed by the renewing of the mind, we will, first of all, know God's will. Isn't that good, right? God's plan for me. You know, God has a plan for you. It's unique. It's only for you. God th has thoughts about you and has made plans for you. That blew my mind as a young man to know that God cared about where I went to college, cared about what I majored in, had a preference on who I dated and married. And I said, God, you haven't just like created everything and pushed it off into the cosmos and said, well, let's just see what happens. But you have plans for people that you want to reveal to them so they walk with confidence and boldness saying, I'm not doing this because I thought it was a good idea. I'm doing this because God said this is what he wants for my life. And so... When we are transfer transformed by the renewal of our minds, we know God's will. God has a plan for me. Number two, we know God's good. God's plan for me is good. You have a, we serve a good God who has good plans for your life. Number three, we know God's motivation. God's plan for me is fulfilling, right? We just read that in Romans 12. You'll know God's will, his pleasing will. His will is actually something you, I remember growing up saying, oh, God, if, if I give you full control of my life, I know what you're going to do. You're going to set me off on some adventure that I don't want to be on. You're going to send me to some city I don't want to live, Baltimore, or some country I don't want to be, Canada. And I, seriously, that's how I thought. I thought, I know if I give God free reign, I'm going to either go to Canada or Baltimore. I don't know why those two stuck out in my head, but that's how I felt. No, no, God's plan for me is fulfilling. It's pleasing. It's stuff I didn't even know I wanted. Right? And then finally, number four, when we allow the transforming by the renewing of mind, we can know that God can be trusted, that God's plan for me will complete me. It's his perfect will. That it means it's his complete will. It brings us to maturity when we allow God's will and we start walking in God's will. Who doesn't want to walk in God's will? I mean, it's good for me, it's fulfilling for me, it completes and restores me. I mean, this is what we want. But it does say in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that there's another choice. We can be transformed by the renewing of the mind and, and embrace God's will at these four levels, or we can be conformed to the patterns of this world. So it says, do not conform to the pattern. Do not do it. 
And, and so where do these patterns, or really what we're calling life traps, where do these patterns, where do these life traps originate? Well, as, as we, we've said the last two weeks, and maybe this is a little bit of review, I don't want to dive too far into review because then we get hung up, uh, but I, I do want to make sure that we can all track a little bit. It's a life trap, you know, the, these patterns of conforming, it's a, it's a pattern of belief that typically starts in childhood or through a traumatizing circumstance. And as a result of that experience, th it's so significant that th that experience reverberates through the rest of your life. And the way it reverberates is it, it begins with something done by us or done around us or done to us. It sometimes, as we'll see with today's life trap, something that, that is withheld from us that results in a moment where we feel either uh, excluded or deprived or abandoned or abused or criticized or some, some uh, uh, sense of emotional um, uh, uh, uh response in that moment of trauma and our response to that moment and the resulting ideas and beliefs and thoughts they become part of us and they become a pattern of belief long after we leave the home we grow up in we look to recreate the situations that give us the same feelings of home do you understand we talked about that in week one. It's called the repetition compulsion, and it's also sin nature, and we expounded on that quite a bit, just to talk about how sin is so deceptive that if you are introduced to uh, rejection as a child or through a trauma, that you acclimate to that rejection, and even though it wasn't homey, it was home to you. And so as you grow up, you look to recreate scenarios and atmosphere and environments where you will get the same result of rejection because somehow you bought into the lie that I'm not worthy of love, I deserve rejection, people will reject me. So we craft unintentionally a life where it's the repetition, where compul there's a compulsion to repeat. And whether it's feeling mistreated or ignored or abandoned or controlled, if you lived in a dysfunctional environment, You'll be drawn to dysfunctional environments that recreate the familiarity of your dysfunctional childhood. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so, so we understand that there are patterns, the Bible says there are patterns that want to keep you locked in cycles of entrapment. And so, if it, so it, it shaped your sense of expectation. It shaped your sense of this is who God is, or this is who I am, or this is what I should be expecting from the world. And each week, as we've done this, we've, we've tackled a, a new life trap and tried to unravel it with some truths to combat the lie that we took hold of. So today's life trap, with any, uh, hopefully that's enough backdrop to kind of get us all on the same page. Are you ready to move forward? You're a talkative Dulles campus today, and I could get used to it. Uh, but check this out. Today's life trap, we're talking about emotional deprivation today that's the name of today's life trap emotional deprivation and this the lie that feeds this pattern is some form of this internal monologue that says i'll never get the love i need the emotional deprivation pattern the life trap says i'll never get the love i need so what is this this is the belief that people will not be there for you that people will not care for you, they won't understand you, they won't listen to you, they won't protect you, and they won't want to share themselves with you, and ultimately you will be alone. Why? Because you've bought into, I'll never get the love I need. You may have never said that out loud to yourself. You may have never said those exact words, but you came to believe that that's your reality. The belief that people will not be there for you. In the inner thoughts of this life trap, uh, you become, you become kind of tormented by an inner sense that you won't be heard, uh, you won't be understood, you won't be cared for, and that uh, someone who, who uh, nobody will ever tune in to your needs. And, and because of that, you're going to be lonely, you're going to be disconnected, even from people who should be closest to you. You even feel this... If you're honest, some of us even feel that towards people we're supposed to be close to. 
and you have a hard time allowing people in, whether it's to guide you or, or protect you, even though that's what you want, there's this resistance to it. You're not good at letting people in. You're not good at letting people love you or to care about you. And, and you feel lonely a lot of the time. And here's the thing that's, that's deceptive about these cycles of, and patterns is oddly you're often attracted to people who are cold or unavailable. You're attracted to people that are cold or unavailable because you've believed the lie. So emotional deprivation is this, it's this deep sense that something is missing. And many times a person in this pattern's only respite from this kind of isolation that they're experiencing is the very early stages of a romantic relationship. In the very early stages of a romantic relationship, there's so much over-communication and so much uh, expression of affection that it, it, it's your favorite season because it, it, it's so much expression that for a minute it allows you to forget that you can't be loved. But those are short-lived because internally you don't tell people what you need. You don't tell people what you need, then you feel disappointed when your needs aren't met. And, and can I just say, don't look around the room. <laughs> this is tough for, for spouses and people who know each other really well. They're like, oh, he's got you today. Uh, probably all of us a little bit, if we're honest. You don't tell people what you need, and then you, you feel disappointed when your needs aren't met. Understand this about yourself. You don't tell people how you feel, and then you're disappointed when you're not understood. Understand this. You don't allow yourself to be vul vulnerable so people aren't even given a chance to reach you, to protect you, to care for you. You feel deprived, but you don't say anything, and then what happens? You start to harbor resentment. You may inwardly and, and possibly even verbally accuse people of not caring enough about you. They don't care about me. They don't care for me. And you become angry. You can become demanding. You can become distant. You can be unreachable. All these things. That's what it looks like internally. The emotional deprivation life trap, that's what it looks like. But, but it also looks, it has a, it has a, um, uh, the appearance of it in relationships is, is notable as well because you, you, you can have a history of breaking off relationships because people get too close to you. And so you've got to blow it up before it starts to conflict with a, a lie you've believed, nobody will love me. And the second somebody starts actually demonstrating a violation of that inner belief, you have to blow it up because even though it's a blanket full of holes, it's the blanket you've had since you were a kid. And you're not going to let go of the comfort that it brings you. You may even sabotage or complicate relationships by becoming hypersensitive to perceived neglect. It might not even be real neglect. It's just I, I'm, I'm very sensitive to that thing. And you, it's because you expect people to read your mind almost magically to be aware of your needs. Or you conveniently find reasons to end relationship. Or you protect yourself from closeness by choosing partners who are not even available. You know they're not available. And that's what the safety and the dysfunction is. You select people who will never get close enough to trigger that life trap. Is this making sense? Some people protect themselves by choosing someone who, who is there, but they're cold or they're ungiving. And in that, you can reinforce your understanding of the pattern of how the world works. I will never have love, and therefore I have crafted, it, crafted an ecosystem that reinforces this dysfunctional belief. And in the end, you don't ask for what you want, and then you become hurt, and then you either withdraw or you get angry when your emotional needs are not met. You end up in this pattern. Come on, it's a pattern. We looked at that word pattern two weeks ago. It's, it's, it's literally the Greek word that it means schemes, schematic. It's the schematic the enemy has drawn up to keep you trapped. And you end up in that pattern, replicating the childhood deprivation. And that false pattern of belief leads to failed patterns of relationship. You hear me? That, that false pattern of belief leads to failed patterns in relationships. And so our attempts to deal with it, 
you know, they usually fail. The, there, there's three ways we attempt to deal with this typically. Uh, the first one, some deal with it aggressively. They get really aggressive. You counterattack, right? You become angry or you become very demanding in relationships. Over communicating without grace. You compensate for feelings of deprivation by getting hostile, you're right? Getting demanding. And you demand a lot, and often you get a lot from the people who can tolerate it. But not everybody will. But when they don't tolerate it and they go away, it reinforces what you suspected all along. See, they wouldn't love me. But it's really part of the aggressive response. The, the second way res- we deal with it is indirectly and superficially. Right? So, so the fact that needs might not have been met in your life, very deep needs, very important needs early on in your life. Um, and there was a feeling of deprivation. But what that can result is is being very demanding about superficial needs. You find yourself becoming really demanding about really insignificant things, right? Uh, what you eat, how you dress, where you go. Uh, you might be demanding about material things. You know, you might be demanding about It could be almost anything except the true object of what you are craving, which is emotional connectedness. That's really what you desire, but because you can't get it, you just become obsessed about, you know, indirectly about superficial things to kind of cover it. And then the third way we deal with it is occupationally. Uh, Some of us deal with it by choosing a field of work that involves meeting the needs of others. And so you get in a line of work, whether it's a social worker or a helping profession or a healing profession, you get in a line of work where you can nurture others and, and uh, you know, compensate for your own feelings of unmet emotional needs by meeting the emotional needs of others. In a similar way, you, you exert uh, great effort towards meeting the needs of your friends, meeting the needs of people around you. You're the listener, but you're never the sharer. Whenever it comes to, well, how are you doing? It's, all, oh, I'm good, I'm good. Let's talk more about you. Because there's the discomfort and the emotional connectedness that comes from being vulnerable. Because it challenges the lie that got you into this pattern, which is you will never be loved. Other people tell you their problems, but you don't share your problems. And, and I'm not saying that this is fabricated. It's because people have legitimately let you down chronically disappointed by others like if you thought today i was going to introduce this life trap and try to talk you out of it like it, they really didn't mean it and they really didn't do it and that really did ha- i'm not no it happened you have you have very good support and evidence it's very compelling evidence to come to the conclusion i won't be loved because this happened or this happened or this was a pattern of experience over a long period of time where i just i just finally admitted what has to be true i told you recently i was talking to somebody and they and they they confided me and said they said i don't know what um well actually they did know what they said i was i was in middle school people didn't connect with me i was always sitting by myself nobody wanted to be a friend and i remember the day i said to myself there must be something wrong with me and it was a little whisper of a lie that the enemy, he, come on, he's, he's the liar, he's the accuser, he's the deceiver. And so he, he whispers that in your ear, and if you take the bait, you're entering a cycle. You're in the schematic, the scheme of, of, of your own demise. By g- tracking into this, the pattern of experience over a period of time, a- a- and it might be that it's true, you can't count on the people that have been in your life because they were not there for you emotionally. That might be true. But if you don't find your way through this this conclusion that you will not. Now, you may not have been emotionally supported, but that does not mean you will never be emotionally supported. And if you don't find your way through this lie, you, you do become trapped. We need to find what do we start talking about? The renewing of your mind, right? the renewing of your mind by the word of God. And we need to find a place of peace and fulfillment and freedom so that we have a hope. So can we switch gears? I I like to spend about 45% of the time describing the life trap, but the rest of the time 
giving the anecdote. Are you ready? So, so whether you have a lot of it, a little of it, or just someone that you love or that's in your life struggles with this, let's move to a, a place of hope. Because we read uh, two weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I reasoned as a child, but when I became an adult, when I grew up, I put away childish things. And so your trauma of your childhood does not have to become the epitaph of your adulthood. Do you hear me? So how, how I think, how you think, how we reason, how we believe, these patterns can be changed. So let me give you four quick steps. Are you ready? Four steps out of the emotional deprivation life trap and establish new patterns of belief. And uh, why not today? Amen? Right? Why not this Sunday? Why not this series? Why not a step forward into God's freedom for you? Number one, I'll give it to you. How do you, how do you make your way out? Start seeing a professional, number one. You say, well, you're a pastor. What do you, aren't you a professional? Yes, I'm a professional. I'm a professional encourager and tell you what God's word says and, and preach and teach and do all the things. But there are professionals in the mental health field that have uh, practical steps that, and tools that they began to help you with to navigate some of these things. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Listen, you got to have a counselor in your life. Now, your citizen group leader might be a, a counselor. That's good. Um, you know, your team leader might be a counselor. Uh, some of our pastors and, and leaders might be counselors in your life. Good. You should have a multitude of counselors in your life. But can I encourage you to get a mental health counselor in your life? Uh, Proverbs 24, 6 says, For by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in an abundance of counselors there is victory. Listen, church has done a bad job in the past at helping people with some of these things because we inadvertently, uh, uh, we, we say things like, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And it's true. Resist the devil in temptation. But we're not talking about a temptation right here. We're really talking about uh, uh, an entrapment of your mind that is going to take some time to, to, to walk your way out of. Right? Now, is it all under the blood? Yes. Did Jesus pay it all? Absolutely, he did. But don't confuse salvation, the moment of forgiveness, with sanctification, the process of walking in freedom. Do you hear me? There is salvation, which is the, the moment of forgiveness. But then there is sanctification, which is the process of walking in God's freedom for your life. So, yeah, it's true. God made all things new in your life. But you've got to walk it out. You've got to start walking in the new that God made for you. So I always make it to this analogy, and I, this analogy works for my mind. I say, if you come into church and, and you broke your leg in the parking lot on the way in, into church, and you're like, hey, you know, I, I snap my leg, it's pretty bad, and we take a look, and it's like the bone is sticking out, and we go, yep, that's a bad one. That's a compound, complex situation, fracture. It's a, it's a bad fracture. And will you pray for me, Pastor? Absolutely, I will pray for you. But we're going to call 911, and as they're en route, I am going to pray a prayer of faith because God can heal. Uh, but uh, we're not going to just tell you, walk it off, you'll be fine. We're going to say, let's get a cast on this thing. Let's get some support around it. Let's get you some crutches. In the meantime, we'll be your, your human crutches to get you to where you need to go, right? Because we understand there's an anatomical, biological reality to the complexity God created you, right? In the same way, your mental health. There is a chemical composition. There are deep, deep uh, biological uh, uh, impact and influence on who you are emotionally and chemically and mentally. So why would we say, go ahead and bandage your leg, and then when you come in with something emotionally or mentally that's tormenting you, say, just walk it off. No, get the support you need. Get the counseling you need. If you need counselor or, or therapy, come on, you're not broken, you're smart. <laughs> That's the reality. I hope you hear it nice and loud today that there is no stigma on getting the help and the support that you need 
everyone should have four people on speed dial on your phone. Your doctor, your pastor, your mechanic, depending on what kind of car you drive, and your mental health professional. That makes you smart. Okay, number two. So first of all, start seeing a professional. Number two, start recognizing the pattern. Just recognize you are in a pattern. And when you start to read through those things that are in your in the app, in the notes that you can reflect on and, and go, huh, these are the signs that I'm that I'm taking a detour into that cycle again. And and those are the danger signs. And ask yourself, are the people I'm pursuing giving less to me than I'm giving to them? You know, you know, if, if people you're pursuing, especially if you're single and you see that this has kind of been a cycle in your life and, and the people you pursue don't listen to you or or they do all the talking and you do all the the caring or the person they're not comfortable sharing uh, any affection with you or they're sporadically available or not uh, very available or they're cold or they're aloof uh, or they're not there for you when you feel vulnerable. How about this? If the less available they are, the more obsessed you become. That's a sign. If the less available they are, the more obsessed you become. That's a sign that you're in the pattern. If you feel a strong chemistry with a with a cold or unavailable person, run. You're living out that pattern of belief that I will never get enough love. And so I'm subconsciously choosing people that will not give me the love I need so I can reinforce the belief system and the pattern that I've accepted for my life. Number three, start working on your communication. This is going to help you a lot. Ready? Proverbs 24, 26. An honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. You know, there's nothing more emotionally connecting than honesty. When you're honest about, it, it probably doesn't occur to you to spell out how you feel. It doesn't occur to you to spell out how, what you need. But be honest. A and instead of, of blaming or demanding in an attempt to get your needs met, communicate. Instead of withdrawing or leaving your needs unmet, stay in it and communicate. And be honest. Ask for what you want. Share your vulnerability and when you find a person who's emotionally generous, it, give that relationship a chance to work. Don't self-destruct it. And finally, number four, start a new pattern of belief in God's transforming truth. And I'm going to give you the truth right now. It's found in 1 John 4, 19. Start a new pattern of belief and let this be your new, the, the new core thought, the foundation that you build on this in this area of your life. We love, 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. See, you have a need. We all do. It's a need for nurture. It's a need for care, for empathy, for some, someone to guide us, to love us. That need inside us, it's given by God. It's not the product of, of something bad. It's something very healthy. You need that. And the life trap, I'll never get the love I need, we're going to replace it. We're going to replace it with, I have already received the love I need. I have already received it. I can love because... God first loved me. And that love is not mystical. It's not religious. It's not distant. It's not cerebral. It's real. It's relational. God actually loves you. And you say, oh, well, you don't know that. They no, God loves you. God loves you with such a love that it led him to the cross to surrender his own life. I'll never get the love I need. No, no, I've already gotten all the love I'll need. And because of this love and the reality of this love, I can actually be a whole person. I can be a healthy person. You'll find the love that you always wanted in your heavenly Father. You will trust. You will forgive. You'll take the risk of healing when you're in his love. When you're in his love, you'll accept the truth that sets you free. I can receive the love I need. 
because I've already received the love of God in my life. See, God is the ultimate love that stabilizes us, stabilizes who you are, stabilizes your relationships. It's in God's steadfast love. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet rejecting him and holding him at arm's length, Jesus loved us and died for us. When we receive this love, when we return to this love, when we meditate on this love, when we actually start to remind ourselves that, oh, God's love for me is real. It stops the conforming process and begins the transforming process and the renewing of your mind. And that's what Ephesians 5 talks about. And we'll end with that. Ephesians 5 says, the washing of the water, it changes and renews your mind. And you start living differently. Can I just read a couple things over you today? When if you're rewiring, if you if you're if you got like this this hard drive and this this uh what do you call it? A virus, right? You've got to deal with the virus, don't you? And cornering this virus is really all about releasing the truth and releasing the truth of God's word. Jeremiah 31, 3. Just receive it. It says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This is God speaking to you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've continued my faithfulness to you. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. See what great love. How about Romans 5, 8? But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I want to end with Jude one twenty one. This is a little out of order, but guys will get this. It says, keep yourself in God's love. It's almost as, as if it knows. There's a pattern and a scheme to get you out of this. There's a pattern and a scheme to knock you off course, and it's going to try to distract you and lie to you and deceive you. But it says, no, no, keep yourself in the truth. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Come on, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his son, his one and only son. That's the love of God, and that's real. And when that hits your life, there's a stability and a strength to say, not only can I be loved, I have been loved. I have been loved with the greatest of loves, not just in something that God does, but something God is. God is love, and His full, all of His love is directed right at me. I'm going to receive God's love, and as I do, I'm going to be able to love others in a new way, with a new strength. I'm going to walk out of this. Come on, do you believe that today? Let me pray for you as we, as we conclude. Father, we thank you today for the truth of your love, the truth of your word, the truth that we can be loved. And God, that truth displaces the lie of the enemy that may have entrapped us and ensnared us and, and maybe even started destructive patterns and relationships and certainly internally. So Father, we ask today that we would walk into the truth. God, we find freedom. The love of God. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. The truth of God sets us free, and the love of God fills us to a place where we can walk out of the pattern, walk out of the cycle. And we understand, Lord, that there's going to be moments that we're tempted to return to that thought and return to that way of thinking and that way of living. But God, we ask that we would just continue to renew our mind. Father, that the word of the Lord, which is our shield of faith, would quench every fiery dart of the enemy as he tries to bring us back to that place of subjugation. But we would rise to a place of victory, walking in the truth. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. To go on the offensive. And to see these patterns and these cycles broken. Why not today? Why not the grace of God in my life today? Why not the freedom of God to walk free of this thing today? In Jesus' name, with every eye closed and no moving in this, moving about, just still for 
one last moment. I want to give you an opportunity because we're, we're talking about walking out of these life traps, but this all really begins at the foot of the cross. It begins with saying, Jesus, I need you in my life. And if there's someone in this room today, and I know that a room this size, there's many, who if you were interviewed on your way out and we were to ask you, are you sure of God's love for your life? Are you sure he loves you and forgives you? Are you sure when you die you'll spend eternity with him? Many in this room would say, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Or maybe I was at one time, but things have kind of happened and drifted. And Or maybe this is the first time you're ever hearing about God's love for you. The Bible says that God showed his love among us when he sent his one and only son. And that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you believe that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And I want to give you an opportunity right now. I'm going to count to three. When I hit three, I'm going to invite you to lift your hand. We're not going to trick you into standing up. We're not going to try to get you to come down front. We're not going to call any attention to you. But lifting your hand is a universal sign of surrender. Lifting your hand is the universal sign of saying, I finally know the answer. I've been looking for it. The answer is Jesus in my life. And I'm going to pray a general prayer over us, and we'll dismiss in a few moments. But if all of today is for this moment, your life will never be the same. To say, I need Jesus. I need his forgiveness. I need his love. Are you ready? One, don't wait. Today is a day of new beginnings. He loves you right where you are, but he loves you too much to leave where you are. Are you ready? Hands are already going up. One, two, three. Say, yeah. Include me in that prayer. Pastor, go ahead. Include me in that prayer. Praise God. Don't let anybody else influence you on this, in this moment. But to say, God, I need you in my life. I surrender to you. I got you. I got you. Anybody else say, yeah, include me in that prayer. What a beautiful day. Say, Jesus, I'm going to walk in your forgiveness, and I'm going to walk in freedom out of some of these life traps, these patterns that have held me back. Maybe you didn't feel comfortable lifting your hand, but you know this is for you. We're, we're all going to pray this prayer nice and loud all together. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I give you my life. Because you first gave me yours. I love you, Jesus, because you first loved me. So I surrender all I am, all I used to be, and all I hope to be. I put my life in your hands. Now say this boldly. I am a Christian. By God's grace, I'm saved. I didn't work for it. I didn't earn it. It's a gift I received in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we rejoice with those who just prayed that prayer?